Hi, I'm Anita Perez, also known as Luminaria Star, and today is January 13th, 2015. Now, before I begin, I would like to call to mind the famous line, Beware the Ides of March. Now, obviously, this is not March. I just told you that this is January. Is there such a thing as the Ides of January? Well, it turns out that there is. In the ancient Roman calendar, the 15th day of March, May, July, or October were the Ides of those months. And every other month had an Ides also which fell on the 13th of those months. So today is the Ides of January. And this is a very special day to me because it's my birthday. <laughs> so, happy birthday to me. And quite a few interesting things happen the Ides of January throughout history. In 1128, Pope Honorius II granted a papal sanction to the military order known as the Knights Templar. They had actually been founded ten years before by Hughes the Cans for the purpose of protecting Christian pilgrims who were on pilgrimage to the Holy Land during the Crusades. They took their name from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which was where their headquarters were based. Now, the original Templars had only nine members, and they were required to be of noble birth. They were not allowed to own personal property beyond their arms, equipment, and clothing, and were also expected to comply with strict vows of obedience and chastity. Mm. In 1127, promotional efforts brought the order to the Pope's attention, and their membership began to attract many more young men of the required noble origins. Their influence increased dramatically along with their wealth, and for almost two centuries, they were a power to be reckoned with in both Europe and the Holy Land. The order was dissolved in 1312 when Pope Clement V condemned their leader, Jacques de Molay, and several other notable members to be burnt at the stake. Clement, Philip IV of France, and Edward II, who was King of England at the time, then seized and divided the assets of the order amongst themselves, in spite of their promise to a competing order called the Knights Hospitallers. And on this day, in 1404, the Act of Multipliers was passed by the English Parliament, forbidding alchemists to use their knowledge to create precious metals. This Act was passed under King Henry IV, who said, quote, But none from henceforth should use to multiply gold or silver, or use the craft of multiplication, and if any the same do, they incur the pain of felony." Unquote. The term multiplication used in this instance refers to the fact that alchemists believed that under certain conditions substances could be multiplied, allowing one to make more, and also that base metals could be turned into precious metals when presented with a specimen to imitate. It was feared that if any alchemist should succeed, it would bring ruin upon the state and cause the treasure hordes of the ruling class to lose their value. Hmm. After more than two centuries of being the law, Sir Isaac Newton reported that the act was repealed due to the efforts of chemist Robert Boyle, who succeeded in getting it overturned in 1689. Why would they care about this so deeply? Because that's exactly what they were trying to do. 
Both Newton and Boyle, in fact, worked very hard at alchemy in their later years. It had not yet acquired the taint of disrepute it now carries. In fact, a good many of the laboratory procedures in the modern science of chemistry originated with the practices of alchemy. On this day, in 1610, Galileo Galilei discovered Callisto, the fourth satellite of Jupiter. In 1913, Delta Sigma Theta, the world's largest black women's sorority, was founded at Howard University in Washington, D.C. In 1930, the first Mickey Mouse comic strip appeared. And in 1942, Henry Ford patented the first plastic automobile, which was 30% lighter than a regular car. Patent 2,269,452 for the chassis of the soybean plastic car was issued on January 13, 1942. But in fact, the prototype model was plastic that was made from hemp. In 1957, Whammo Company produced the first Frisbee. I think that's my favorite entry of all. In 1962, Ernie Kovacs, a comedian, died in a car crash in West L.A. at 42. He was only 42. In 1966, President Lyndon Baines Johnson appointed the first African-American cabinet member making Robert C. Weaver head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD. That's the agency that develops and implements national housing policy and enforces fair housing laws. In 1968, Weaver advocated the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which prohibited, prohibited discrimination against any per person because of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, or national origin. In 1967, the Rolling Stones appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. I actually remember that. And a number of famous people share this birthday with me. In 1832, Horatio Alger Jr. was born in Chelsea, Massachusetts. In 1866, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff was born in Alexandropol, Armenia, in the Caucasus Mountain region. In 1919, Robert Stack, a famous actor, was born in Los Angeles. In 1931, Charles Nelson Riley, a famous actor, was born in New York City. In 1961, Julia Louis Dreyfus, comedian, was born in New York City. In 1966, Patrick Dempsey was born in Lewiston, Maine. In 1977, Orlando Bloom was born in Kent, England. And in 1884, our featured entry was born. Singer Sophie Tucker, known as the last of the Red Hot Mamas, was born in Sonia Kalish in the Ukraine on this day in 1884. Her family moved in, to the United States and opened a restaurant in Hartford, Connecticut, where she sang for tips between waiting on customers. In her own words, quote, I would stand up in the narrow space by the door and sing with all the drama I could put into it. At the end of the last chorus, between me and the onions, there wasn't a dry eye in the place, unquote. She married young for the first time and had a son named Albert. But when she separated from her husband and went on the road as a performer, she left her son with her family, 
because she really couldn't bring a small child on the road with her. Now, obviously, the first marriage didn't last, and unfortunately, neither did the two others that she had later in life. Tucker blamed the failure of these marriages on the fact that she had become too adjusted to economic independence, saying, quote, Once you start carrying your own suitcase, paying your own bills, running your own show, you've done something to yourself that makes you one of those women that men like to call a pal and a good sport, the kind of women they tell their troubles to, that you've cut yourself off from the orchids and the diamond bracelets except those that you buy for yourself. No matter what degree of success she attained, she always faithfully sent the lion's share of her income back to Connecticut to support her son and family. Albert was her only child and wound up being mostly raised by Sophie's sister, Annie. Her career spanned the years between 1903 and 1965, and she watched many changes happen in society and the performing arts as she valiantly persevered. In her earliest vaudeville appearances, much to her chagrin, she was forced to perform in blackface and adopted a southern accent at the insistence of her managers. As vaudeville died, Sophie adapted and went on to become stronger and more successful than ever. Her performances were characterized by her wry and often body wisecracking humor. She was frank about her origins, was proud of being Jewish, and refused to adopt a pretentious manner. A great many of her jokes were aimed at her own self-perceived flaws, especially her size. She caught the attention of famed talent agent William Morris and released a number of hit records, including some of These Days, written by songwriter Shelton Brooks, which title was later borrowed for her 1945 biography. Her accomplishments were numerous. She hosted her own radio show, appeared in movies, became president of an early actors' trade union, toured Europe and performed for royalty. There was even a Broadway musical based on her early career called Sophie. She befriended other performers of many generations and races, and was well known for her kindness, her easygoing yet shrewd nature, and her willingness to laugh at herself. She remained active right on up to her death in 1966. To the very end, she remained loyal and devoted to her son, family, and friends. Hail and farewell, Sophie Tucker, my birthday sister of old. And that concludes this entry of a metaphysician's journal. I wish you peace.